Hello. Hello. <laughs> it's a Kirby <laughs> hand. Hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Welcome to All and Sundry. Welcome back to the island that is called Pencil to Pencil, your pandemic podcast. Uh, I am Jamar Nicholas, uh, being uh, censored by our sponsor right now. And I'll t- t- totally try to move that. <laughs> um, uh, I am Jamar Nicholas, Philadelphia native and cartoonist in good standing. Uh, joined, as always, by my best bud, Mike Manley. Say hi, Mike. Hi. <laughs> And my other best bud, Brett Blevins. That's a lot of bees, Brett. Say hey to the people. How are you, sir? I'm all right. I'm a cartoonist in dubious standing. <laughs> that that means that you may have paid your uh, your your tithing this year, right? Is that it? Tithing is we have to we have to uh, have tithings now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would say dues, but I think it's different. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, as always, we're joined and sponsored by our good friends uh, at Graphicsly, who make pencil, uh, make Clip Studio Paint, which you can see uh, floating over the top of my bucket hat. Uh, and also our other sponsor, Tomorrow's Publishing. Uh, I'm going to get this right one of these days. It's your teacher left, Mike, that, <laughs> um, who uh, brings such great uh, printed material to <laughs> to us every month, like uh, our magazine, Draw Magazine, uh, Write Stuff, Brick Journal, Kirby Collector, on and on and on. Uh, so you should go check them out. As soon the Kirby as Bricks, the, the Kirby Crackle, the Dot Journal. <laughs> the Kirby Crackle Quarterly, is that it? Yeah. Um, so if you guys were here last night, you know that we had uh, Lee Weeks on, which was a very great uh, episode. Lee is a fantastic person and a magnificent uh, cartoonist, and I think we all had a great time with him. Uh, just uh, as everybody knows from le- from yesterday, and I'll reiterate it right now, uh, this is our second podcast of the week. Uh, because of the upcoming holiday, we are not going to be live on Saturday. So the 4th, we are going to take a break. Are we going to reap? We'll have a, uh, maybe we'll have a watch party. Ooh, yeah, we could do an all-day watch party because we have that much content, Mike Manley. There's, there you go. Or you could go <laughs> to our, uh, watch, listen to our older podcasts mm-hmm. at PencilToPencil.com. That's right. If you are if you feel that you need to hear our luscious voices in your ear. The dulcet tones. And that's right. There's no fireworks this, because most places are now not having fireworks. So well, that, that's good. Get I'm your fireworks thinking. right here. Uh, oh, I like that because, you know, we keep it popping. That's right. Uh, uh, so for uh, everybody who's watching on YouTube, hello. Everybody that's watching us on Facebook, hello, hello. Uh, I cannot see who is in the chat at this moment. So if you want to um, interact with us, please type into the chat section. Uh, where you're from, and say hello, and then we'll get some questions started. I'd like to bring in our guest of the evening. Um, I just told Dan that I totally stole this whole format for, for his Drink and Draw podcast. And tonight we will steal his soul. <laughs> That's right. Um, one of my favorite uh, man crushes I have is one with Dan Panosian. I, I love his stuff, and I've uh, been a big fan of his and also a friend for a long time. It's been great to watch his artistic journey unfold uh, before our eyes. And I think we are all the better for it. So let's bring him on and say some nice things. Welcome, Dan Pinocian. Dan! Hey! Woo. What's up, that, brother? That's, that's plenty of nice things. I think I'm good. <laughs> all right. All right, I filled your cup. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> all right. A, uh, I'm, I'm going to let you guys talk. I'm going to check out the chat, and I'll be right oh. back. Yeah, I'll it's an honor. I mean... We've been all been friends for years and years, and um, it's, it's kind of cool to see us all together here. It's amazing how uh, things work out. Yeah, I, I think I think the first time I met Dan, you was in Howard Mackey's office. Yeah, I was inking you on uh, Quasar. Right, and then I think I met you, and then the same day I met Tom Palmer. Well, you got you got the worst of the two. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, Mike. Uh, Brett, I don't know if he ever told you the story, but um, so I, you know, he, Mike probably had, had no idea who I was. I was brand new to the, to Marvel, and I started inking him. And you know, Mike was doing killer work on on Quasar, and he would, I think, by the second issue, he's like, "Oh my god, I think I, I think let me let me lend him a little hand here." And um, I I was trying to ink everything with a brush, 
and that means everything. So I didn't bring a crow quill to the faces and, and Mike did a few faces and I was, I think I called you up or something, Mike. And I was like, so excited. Like, how did he get, how did he achieve that line? Cause I just hadn't seen too many, too much original art at all. And, uh, um, but, but then I made the mistake of mentioning it to Howard and then, and then, um, Mike got in a little bit of trouble there. I, I recall. <laughs> Back <laughs> in the day when you could still get in trouble if the editor didn't like say yeah. everything. Yeah. yeah it's like that he danced the anchor. You can't, you shouldn't be inking it. And I'm like, no, I wish Mike would ink all the faces, you know? <laughs> yeah. I think what I had done is I'd inked something with a. Rapidiograph. Yeah. Rapidiograph. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, were you working? How, what was your first job at Marvel? Were you still, because I know you had something to do with like Neil, Neil Adams. Uh, I was working, his... I, I, I visited New York. Um, a friend of mine, Joe Naftali, who had Continuum Comics, um, brought me out there to Science of Comics at the old Greenberg shows. And yeah, I met Walt Simonson. I met Neil Adams. I, and um, uh, Neil said, hey, you can start working, inking Earth 4. It was a, a book. I, I think Ron right. Wilson was penciling it. And uh, I was butchering Ron Wilson and <laughs> for for a little while. And then um, DC gave me some work. Um, I was doing Spelljammer as a Dungeons and Dragons comic book. And again, wow. I, was just, I was just inking. Um, at that point, I wanted to pencil, but um, you know, I just didn't have the chops. And then my first job was um, doing backups for Thor. Walt Simonson called up Ralph Macchio, you know, and just it's just like that. I got I got hired doing backups. So it was very fortunate, very lucky. It was like my first first day in New York. Literally, I think it was the second wow. day technically. But wow, you know, th that's a very unusual set of circumstances. But that's the type of guy Walt Simonson is, I guess. Yeah, I'm not even. I, I know Walt Simonson, but I'm not. I, I wouldn't say, you know, I'm friends with the guy he's, he's just he's a friend to pretty much everybody in the business it seems you know he's just that type of yeah. a gracious yeah. person and um and so was joe neftali for for having me out there i was just inking i think he had hired um mark bright to draw the the dark who's you know and i got okay. to ink him right right out of the gates and and mark's pencils i don't know if have you ever inked them like I, I'm trying to think if I inked him on a fill-in issue of maybe Alpha Flight or something, because there was a while after John. Well, he he was the yeah. type of penciler that, like nowadays, you just you might not necessarily use an inker. He's just the pencils look like they how they how he yeah. probably would have liked them to be inked, and they were dark enough and tight enough, you know. You just like up today, the contrast. Yeah. <laughs> No offense, Brett. I would never want to see your your you know pencils ink. They're just so beautiful and lush. Like now, the printing and the in the way you can reproduce pencils, they just it's just beautiful, really. Wow. So. You know, it hasn't occurred to me to try to do that yet. <laughs> yeah, you use a lot of side of the pencil and use that, that gradation. Now, now you can pick all that stuff up. Yeah. Wasn't Garney doing that for a while? A he was. He was a lot of the stuff Ron was doing. Um, they they were just enhancing. Remember Laverne Kadinsky? Mm -hmm. um, he I think he even won like an Eisner for the first like digitally enhancing. Or he was nominated. I don't know if he won necessarily, but he had done a Thor book that John Romita Jr. had penciled. Oh right. And it was kind of controversial at the time. Like oh my God, no anchor. You know how could that be? But um, now, granted, I was I was not thrilled about it either. But what he had done was he had, he had probably just done an intense job of levels on his um, pencils, brought up stuff, and then if there was an area that was designated to be uh, black, he probably just filled it in. But um, you know now, uh, it's, you really I don't know. You look at like an Assad Ribic, you know. That, yeah. that's, I don't I don't believe that stuff is inked. I think it's it's just straight to uh, color. Right. They, right. Now, what had you know? You are from Florida, right? Well, I'm I'm originally from Cleveland. Cleveland, okay. I, I grew up I grew up primarily in, in Florida. I went to um, most of grade school and high school there. And your dad was a like commercial artist, right? A layout guy or something like that. He was a, he was a commercial ad guy, and he worked in Cleveland. Then when we moved to Florida, there there was a comp a big company, um, an aerospace company called uh, Harris that employed pretty much all of Brevard County. And he worked as an art director over there. And then he eventually uh, form, formed his own uh, ad agency. 
but so he was he was a big he was he he was a great cartoonist. He was a great letterer. He did he started out as a in a sign shop, so he could. I mean, you could tell him any font, and he knew it by heart, and he would letter it perfectly. I mean, he was amazing. Wow. Um, but he also he also understood comic books. Like he knew who Walt Simonson was. He knew who Joe Kubert and Neil Adams were, and John Buscema. Wow. Um, so he fantastic. he introduced me to comic books. He I think he always wanted to be a comic book artist, basically. Huh? Did he did he letter any drawing fundamentals or anything like that? Or he didn't. You know, like like all of us. I don't know if you'd. Go, hey, son, get into comics. Um, he didn't. He didn't want me drawing. He he'd prefer I was like a doctor or a lawyer or you know an Indian chief. Dan, show me your hands. There you go. Yeah, he broke my hands. <laughs> he gave me one drawing lesson when I was, I think, like six. Just those fundamentals, like the like a block for the torso, um, two blocks for the arms, uh, you know, bicep and forearm and legs. And I kind of ran with it. I just wanted to emulate him in every which way. He would come home from work and it was like a you know typical you know back east you guys are all back east um right yeah. well you have to deal with that snow and we weren't living in cleveland central we were right outside of cleveland so it took him sometimes an hour and a half two hours to get in and out of downtown cleveland to the agency yeah, yeah. and but he always managed before he came home he'd have another page of a batman i guess it was like kind of a splash page comic book it was more like a coloring book story for a kid but he'd always draw a new adventure and tell a story for Batman, and I was—I just thought that was the greatest. Every single day, wow. five days a week, I'd get a brand new page to this book. Um, do, do you still have any? I'm sure I do. I have. I have, my office is kind of a a shrine. We didn't get along that great when I got older. When I was in high school, we, we butted heads quite a bit. But mm -hmm. um, as much as we didn't get along, I always I have a deep respect and love for him. And he was great. He's the type of guy who's great with little kids. I think. He came up. He came up with the in the depression. He was born in 1930, and um, you know, just time. You know, I, I was kind of headstrong and wild kid, so mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't the greatest scenario. But you know, I, I still love I still love him. But it was it was tough. But yeah, I have his I have like his ashes over there. Um, his old uh, a lot of his old morgue. The morgue sounds kind of. Sad. No, the morgue is right. Yeah. No, but some of the listeners might not know is it, it's like reference material, like whether it's illustration or design or even photographs um, that he kept. It's kind of interesting. It's like a it's like a time capsule into the past. Oh yeah, I, I bet. And, you know, it's funny because my grandfather uh, was also a display litterer, and he yeah. taught himself that back during the depression. Mm -hmm. by practicing lettering and um so he was the same same thing and he, he was a better grandpa when you were little than when you were older yeah. so i think yeah. it, maybe that was typical of guys who kind of grew up under the depression i don't yeah. know but um but yeah that was i mean that was even in high school my i had two classes i had like the regular artsy fartsy fine art and then i had commercial art or, or uh, vocational I, art. I think that's my, a great one asset. Teacher, one of my teachers was a letterer. And that's what she used to use. She used to letter diplomas and stuff. Oh, wow. So. Do you think that... I've lettered some comic that, books, too. Do you think that exposure to the lettering is what made you focus on using a brush only in the beginning? Um, I, I practiced a, a little bit with a brush, and... Um, Mostly, I used a um, Mars Graphic 3000. I, I still have a ton of them. I, John Byrne did a John Byrne did some kind of episode in the back of Fantastic Four where he explained his. Um, here's one. Oh, okay. Um, mm -hmm. Where he explained how he inks, and so this side is a very. It's probably the most flexible brush pen out there. They don't make them anymore. And then on the other side is a um, little tip. Uh, but so I said, John Byrne was my hero at that point. I had, I had uh, gone John Byrne crazy. So I started just practicing with those. But obviously, that's not the same as a real brush. When I got to Marvel, um, and I started, I was in the offices, and I'd see the actual pages, like these beautiful pages by experienced inkers. They're all obviously inked with a crow quill or a brush. And uh, I immediately picked up a brush, and it was, you know, it's trial by fire. <laughs> it's not as easy as, you know, I, I, I 
practice, but I would just practice. I would fill up 11 by 17 pages with just drawing straight lines, drawing, you know, always a, you know, non-artists will always say, how do you do that? I can't even draw a straight line. You know, most <laughs> artists can't, but I think a lot of inkers learn how to pull a straight, a straight line. And um, these days when I do pages, I, re I almost flat out refuse to use a uh, straight edge. I'll just, mm -hmm. you know, try to just do it by sight. And if it's a little bit wobbly, so what, you know, it doesn't, I used to be such a stickler. I was so into Scott Williams and Terry Austin that right. Everything it is had to be precise. Like yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, Terry Austin was everything to me. Cause you know, I, I would pick up anything he would do. Um, I don't know if there's any real anchors out there where I think people, fans were just so enamored with what Terry brought to whoever he was working on. The only time I ever had, like, I, I, I saw, well, maybe this isn't the perfect match was he did, um, he did a fill in issue of daredevil on Frank Miller. And it was mm -hmm. unusual because it's such a break from what Klaus Janssen was doing. And it, it was just a very linear approach to some of Frank's line work. It still looked amazingly cool. But um, that was the only time I was like, ah, I kind of, I actually prefer Klaus on this, but I still cherish that issue. It was the issue where I think it says no more Mr. Nice Guy and Daredevil has a, a big handgun a revolver on the camera. Right, cover. right, yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, I have a question from the room. Oh. Um, Walt Simonson oh. says, Dan, <laughs> how come you don't have a real name on screen? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, you know Walt. what? That's from the drink and draw, uh, Walt. <laughs> And I, I didn't, I didn't change it when I logged into um, the stream here. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I get, uh, I get nervous around uh, Walt. I, I'm such a fan. I'm uh, gonna, Dan, I'm start I'll blushing. Yeah, yeah. I'll, switch, I'll switch this up. Uh, Eric <laughs> says, "Hey, Eric, thanks for asking a question. Does Dan have any anecdotes about how or why he transitioned from primarily inking to becoming such a strong penciler?" Thanks, Eric. Well, I don't know if I'm that strong of a, a penciler yet. I think I'm, I'm still learning quite a bit. But when I got into Marvel, I always wanted to emulate like Simonson and Byrne and Frank Miller and these guys that were doing 100% of the work and, and even writing in most cases and writing for other people too, for that matter. So um, I wasn't good enough to draw at that point, um, but I thought by osmosis, by by inking some of these people that somehow it would be almost like being in class and I would learn, like I would somehow right. absorb that drawing. And of course that's not the case. Even when, even when you're doing finishes, I mean, it's a little, it's a little bit and of something, but it, it took me kind of um, getting out of comic books for a little while and have, and, and doing it, working in advertising. It's kind of because of the speed involved in a lot of storyboarding, for commercials and, and other aspects of commercial artwork, it kind of stripped away any of the um, comic book aspects of it. And so uh, it, it really helped. And I took a lot of um, life drawing classes, which was- uh, Yeah, I remember uh, that. I remember when you were doing that, when you were going to doing the life- Yeah, it was it was very Dr. humbling. Sketchy. Was Dr. Sketchy for a while? Did they have those in LA? Dr. They had Sketchy? those. They had Dr. Sketchy. There was a, um, you know, we've all been to um, San Diego Comic-Con. There's this one guy, Jeff, something or other in San Diego. And he had a, I lived in Laguna Beach at the time and he had a drawing thing. So I would drive all the way down to San Diego to go to his uh, drawing sessions. And, you know, it's, it's classic uh, life drawing and very, very different from nineties. You know, today's <laughs> comic book landscape is so diverse. Like you have, you know, right. cartoonists, you have people doing realism, you have manga, you have all these different styles in, in between, but, the you know, 90s was all about like how close can you make your stuff look like Jim Lee or or maybe Todd McFarlane. Those were the that was the pinnacle at that point. And um, I had kind of broken away from my fascination with John Byrne, and I was you know trying just to be Jim Lee. And and you can't apply a Jim Lee nose to someone who doesn't have a Jim Lee nose when you're drawing them. So those those I those fundamentals that you learn in in comic books, those shorthand. Um, yeah lines and that's all they are lines to to just dis display a nose it's not going to work if someone has a different nose shape you know so i really had to look at the figure it was very humbling it was it, it was it was embarrassing um because i i was making my living as an artist and i realized that i i had a long way to go
So um, I, it's just taken years, and I, 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 I just, I just love drawing, and I love comic books. So, you know, being on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you're seeing all these, you're seeing inspiration every single day. So it's, it's a zillion it's, times a day. It's like know. it's like an endless parade of of people all over the world. I mean, that's also I think a thing that's really different now is like when you broke in or when I broke in or Brett or, or, or Jamar, you were just seeing people like in your peer group working in a very specific channel of mm -hmm. the industry. And now you see the entire yeah. world you of see, people. That you see, stuff. you see art students that have mastered how to paint in, in Photoshop or, um, yeah. you know, clip studio. That's, it's just mind boggling and the colors. And it, I mean, that's another thing I, I, I like coloring my own work and it takes me longer to color things than it does to draw them both penciling and inking because you have endless possibilities. There's like, do you, how do you want the, the reader in, in, in the comic book case to feel? And there's colors that will help enhance that. There's ways to do that. There's ways, a million ways to light something. It's just, it's, it's a lot. Well, uh, the other thing I, because uh, I mean, we've been friends such a long time. I've seen your, your evolution. Uh, and a, a lot of inkers, I mean, being a, a monthly comic book inker is not what it was even 10 years ago because everything has changed so much. Like you said, guys are doing digital. Uh, you're not inking necessarily on the original anymore. Um, mm -hmm. So you're transitioning into, because the old guy, the old guard, like the classic guys were actually pencilers that were just too slow to usually to draw like a monthly comic, right? Yeah, you would or always look forward to, to uh, yeah, like John B. Simba, if he, when if he ever got to ink himself, it was kind of a treat. Right, right. Um, so how old were you when you started? Did you start at fanzines and stuff to end up coming up to New York? Or Oh, you mean when I was a kid? Yeah, I was, how, um, how old were you when you came to Marvel? How, how... I was 21 when I came to Marvel, but I, wow. I was working at, um, when I was like, you see, I was talking to Jamar before we got on and his Dungeons and Dragons shirt there in the old school <laughs> one. I used to, I used to put ads in the back of Dragon Magazine. Oh, look at that. I, now I want that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I used to put ads in the back of Dragon Magazine. That cost me, I think it started out as 120 bucks or $80. It went up to eventually $160. And I, got that initial money from mowing lawns, but I would draw, you would send me a self-addressed stamped envelope and I would I would send you back a character sheet where you'd, you'd, you'd describe your character and there was a little like traced outline that you could maybe put like, oh, it's this type of sword. And then I would draw um, your character for 20 bucks. <laughs> and that's that really taught me how to, how to pencil. So, oh, Walt Simonson's leaving. Alert, alert. Alert, alert. Bye, Walt. What do you say here? Andrew yeah, Loomis. Oh, there we go. Let's see the words of wisdom here. All right, I'll read it. Jamar got to run deadlines. But with regard to Gar's question, Andrew Loomis in one of his books, maybe creative illustration addresses that very subject. Long time ago now for me, but I think he worked out ways to divide a page into irregular pieces and let a drawing grow out of that. Book right. may be on the web, or maybe somebody will be here to remember it. That is, you can, you can get all those books on, on the internet now for free. I don't know if that's a... Bye, Bye. 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 I, it was savelumis.org and it's called informal subdivision. Oh, yeah. You know, I always, I, I'm too lazy to. It's called dynamic symmetry. He had two names. Right. Oh. And I actually found a weird thing. I don't know if I can find it. Um, I had a, you remember those Walter Foster books, those big books he yeah. had for like a dollar? There was one that had a whole thing on that. It was also in that Loomis thing. So evidently it was a thing that was like, must have been in like the 30s or the 40s because some of those books are pretty old. Yeah. Talking about that big way of cutting up the composition. Because you say, oh. You know, I, wish, I wish I studied that more and, it, and that kind of inspires me to take a look at that because, you know, there's a lot to be said about what makes a, um, what makes a comic book page and panels. I think I'm offending everyone, Mike. Everyone's leaving. Walt left. Brett left. Jamar's leaving. I, I was going to show that book. Oh, here it is. I just recently rearranged everything, and I couldn't remember where I put it. See, I that's what happened. You, you should never get in order because then you'll 
<laughs> you know, you need to just live in piles. You remember what your piles are. Brett, Brett's studio looks like a, um, a surgeon. <laughs> back there. My studio is like a, it's like madness. It's like a beautiful mind. <laughs> yes. Here's a few. Uh, hold, hold on. Let me give you the screen. Am I back? Uh, again? No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let me, uh, is that, I, I, I found I actually have my, uh, yeah, I have a copy of, uh, I opened it here. Hold, there's a second here. Where That's pretty cool. Yeah, I wish I should, I need to go back and study that. Here's, here's a page where he bases compositions on letters. Huh. And what was the point of that? Just a variety. It's like when you're composing in and out every day, just anything that might spark an idea, just take you in a different direction. It's like for doodling to see. What experimenting might lead you to? Here, I mean, Brett, uh, do, you use, do you ever use that, or is it just kind of ingrained now after years of? I do many times because of uh, I haven't recently because I've been kind of focusing on a different process. But I used to when I was really grinding out tons of pages a year. I would sometimes get a script and read it, so I'd have it in my mind, and then I would take a couple of pieces of paper and just drip ink and smear. Graphite, just make all these abstract like shapes true and yeah. around them. Share my screen, Jamar. Oh, okay. Then, uh, when I'd go to take my script, oh, yeah, I'd find a panel that I could would suggest a shape, a figure position, or something based on one of these abstract rectangles I'd made. Then I would compose in and out of that, you know, before and after that shot, just as a way of breaking up the rhythm, you know, to try to do something a little different. So, yeah. My so father, my father used to do something where he, he cut out some irregular shapes of paper um, and he would put them over a, a black piece of paper and create and create shapes for composition. And he tried to, I mean, I'm, I'm sure I absorbed some of it, hopefully, maybe, but um, it's it, it was similar to what, if you go down a little further, um, what, is this Loomis or is this one it's of the- all out of creative illustration. Yeah. Although if actually, uh, Edgar Payne's book on landscape painting also touches on these exact terms yeah. uh, because you have, you know, your formal and then, you know, this, then he gets to how to break it up and make it informal. So you get an interesting. Yeah. See, if I, if I, if I had that many cross versing lines and everything, I would turn into a Mason by the end of it, <laughs> you know, Wait a minute, Dan. Didn't I know that you do some sort of trigonometry to your pancakes? Is that is that true? <laughs> Who told you that? I was with you once. Oh, at bre at yeah, breakfast. A, I, I, <laughs> it bothers some people if they have ever have breakfast with me. I'll, I'll cut up my pancakes into a big, like like a pizza pie, but then I'll make a, a circle in the middle, and then I have like the little dollar size pancakes, and then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> then I eat them, and I eat them, and I create like a design um, pattern, um, and it seems to irritate a few people for some reason. It's just, I don't know. I, I guess that's a kid in me, you know, the little, little built kid. No, no funny way of pouring the syrups. And... Well, I like I like the syrup. I'll you know I'll have a few bites, and then the syrup will just kind of fit in there like little lakes, triangle lakes. <laughs> you know, I have a I have a book since we're show and tell. This is actually a two a tomorrow's book. This is called Panel Discussions. Oh, that's a great book. Um, hold on, let me give myself the screen. Uh, that tomorrow's published maybe ten years ago, and it's got uh, great sections. Uh, there's a really good one where Michael Ringo goes through his process, which uh, mm -hmm. I thought was super cool. Um, here, hold on, let me grab it real quick. I got mine too. I I, I actually started basing mine on. Um... The Ringo page, yeah. There's a. <laughs> this is harder than it seems. Like see the silhouettes and breaking uh -huh. it down. And, and Talk about yeah. another really gracious guy, Michael Ringo. Yeah. Um, I remember I just I first started penciling, and we were in our group, our uh, drawing room group, and Mike actually wrote. I didn't even know him. And Mike, I just knew him from being in our group together. Mike wrote me personally to tell me. He liked some of the stuff, and it really inspired me to keep going. I'm like, if, if Michael Ringo actually liked that, then, you know, and he's, he's he was just such a very giving guy. 
Yeah, I thought. Yeah, yeah. You, didn't I, to, I, you didn't have to do that. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I think the bull that our our little secret group was a good group of good guys. We all we all helped, yeah. shared, mm -hmm. traded information and and things like that. I, I it was a very good it was a very good uh, experience. But uh, what about yeah. me popping off all the time though, Mike? <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Hey, Dick, I have some I have some questions from the room. Okay. I'm going to try to stay on top of these, Dan, because they're all here for you, brother. And oh, they're yeah? stacking up. All right. Uh, Julianne says, question to Dan, how do you apply your brushes on your art after uh, read and saw Mattel Herlan before uh -huh. Heavy Metal? You like the way I hooked that up, right? Wow. <laughs> Very uh, cosmopolitan international there. Well, you know, I'm a Pisces, so. Um. <laughs> I guess, uh, you know, when you when you guys probably saw heavy metal a lot um, longer yeah. than I have. But when, when I was reading it as a teenager, I mean, that introduced me to, to guys like Mobius and um, and that kind of a different style of rendering than, than you'd see typically. I mean, the closest approximation I could make in my head was like, oh, that kind of looks a little bit like like Robert Crumb. I thought mm -hmm. to myself, yeah, um, some of the inking, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I love European BDs. I have like a whole, I don't know if you can see behind there because I have part of my mirror. It's a right. oh, okay. so your shelf um, there. Yeah, I have shelves of just those books are beautiful. I mean, those they really treat artists well there and they appreciate uh, it's not, not, not too, I mean, not too much superhero stuff, which which I was fine with. Um, well, you did a book, right? You did a, uh, I, I did a book called John Tiffany with Stephen Desberg, who wrote. Who writes still writes the Scorpion that Enrico Marini uh, draws, and it's a it's basically a um, kind of a James Bond sort of character, but he's an assassin. Someone's trying to kill him, like the assassin is being assassinated. I did two two books over there, and I'm I'm working on a uh, secret. Every every artist has a secret project that they can't talk about, but the secret project I'm working on right now is. Um, a book that's being edited by um, the team at uh, Dargo, but it's it's not for um, it, it won't be initially published in France, but it's it's that type of thing. It's an oversized formatted book, and I'm doing an adaptation where I'm adapting a novella, and I get to, mm. in a sense get to write it. I'm not really writing it, I guess, but adapting it. Mm. So it's a lot of fun, and it has a different look than um, than American superhero comics, although. Like we we're saying, there's so many variations these days. It's hard to say there's a house style for Marvel or DC anymore. Yeah, I think. I mean, you know, Joe, the great Joe Cena just recently passed away last week, and like to me, that when I think of the Marvel house style, it looks like Joe Cena. You know, that just that perfect, yeah. like everything was perfect with the brush and the pen, or like DC sort of had like I guess Giordano sort of was like the yeah, in the at least from the yeah. 70s Garcia on. Garcia Lopez, Garcia right. Lopez and Giordano, yeah, kind of yeah. created that house look. Yeah, and and now you're right. I mean, even, I mean, there used to be a real clear uh, border between guys who worked for Fantagraphics, and even guys who did like underground, like Crumb. You know what I mean? Like more like uh, mm -hmm. racy stuff, and then you had like the the, the Love and Rocket stuff and, you know, Dan Klaus. And then uh, you had other indie people. And like then Bill you had, Ray. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, um, right, which is like not, it's like Dirty Mad Magazine or something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. um, but now, I don't know, in the last 10 years, and I think but also because a lot of people, like us have sort of kind of gone out and you've had another two generations or so of people come in yeah. and they're mm -hmm. not pulling from what we pull from they're pulling from more manga and, and yeah everything yeah mm -hmm. so yeah, we kind I of mean, reference cool. that in the brian lee o'malley uh episode you know there's a whole generation of cartoonists who have have no you know who would you say your biggest influence is, Jamar, as far as your, your like a style icon or? 
this is this is wild as uh, you know i was i always talk about my love for comic strips i kind of came to comic books late later but uh there's this guy uh he changed his name recently his name is dawood anyabwile who created brother man in the 90s and brother man was a like a tectonic shift for uh kind of like i don't even want to call it urban cartooning but it was kind of during the self-publishing blitz and he was doing the stuff that just kind of opened the floodgates for people like me who were trying to do something that just wasn't in mainstream comics yet and it didn't have a name or shape yet Mm -hmm. and when he started doing that stuff i was like oh okay i'm in now and I was off to the races, so it might. I think Brother Man was a big part of my uh, my wheelhouse. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, you have a very distinct style that you've been refining and refining over the years, and um, obviously, it's done very well for you. And thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Oh, I think it's it's interesting that you you mentioned that because <clears throat> I remember, like, when I was in high school, I knew people that had a, a Japanese club, and at that. Mm. They would have they had friends in Japan that would send tapes over, and then they would redub the tape themselves. Mm-hmm. This is mm-hmm. before you could you know, like you it wasn't easy to find. Maybe if you were in New York or something, but in Michigan, yeah, New York, you find it. L.A. has a big. I remember Ninja Scroll came out. I was so excited. Right. Um, right. That um, still holds up, by the way. That's still badass. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there was this. You had people digging on this other culture. There's that fascination with the otherness that you mm-hmm. get when you're looking at the, the anime and the manga stuff, which I think really appeals because it doesn't look like, it didn't look like the stuff here. But then you have people that are like Jamaro, if you're doing your the American, sort of the American version of what the Japanese are doing, which is taking the iconographic and the styles of traditional mm-hmm comics and disney and then putting it through their cultural lens so you have artists here now who are doing that who are taking old ideas and styles and kind of mashing it up and putting it through because you would see that in the i i think a little bit in the the guys who were tagging stuff because they were into letter forms right they were into lettering and then they would kind of work off of that when they were Mm -hmm. i don't know maybe i'm just making it all up no, you're totally right. My sound went out. No, I'm kidding, Mike. I heard it. <laughs> uh, I had, hold on. I lost my place. All right. You guys keep say, talking. I was going to say, like, I, I'm more and more interested in just uh, from a from a story perspective, um, just distilling that idea and getting it to the reader. And it's, as I look at guys like Darwin Cook, and Tim Sale, and I'm trying to think of some of these other guys that that are concentrating more on the story. And, and like Brett was pointing out, like the composition, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be said about compos. There's a lot to be said about composition, and 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 how that tells the story, and what you leave out in that negative space, and where you leave the eye. And um, uh, you know, a guy like Darwin Cook, he could do up to six pages a day at times. It was a very like raw version of of Bruce Tim meets, you know, some other, uh, I forget. I mean, there's a lot of different amalgamations that created his style. It's still very, it's Darwin's style. It wasn't Bruce right. Tim's style. It was too, but it's, it had that animation background, but he had, he had taken it to a place where he communicated his ideas exceptionally well. And there's a lot of people that were copying them and still copy them to this day. But um, he just... Uh, you know, what's, I, I just find it interesting because I'd, I'd love to be able to to do more page. I could do a, I can pencil and ink a page a day. That's what I do every day. I pencil and mm-hmm. ink a page. Um, mm-hmm. But imagine if you could do two or three and and still convey exactly what you wanted to convey convey artistically. Right. You know, you still right. can evoke evoke those. You know, the most important. I think I heard you guys talking about it at one point. Like the most important thing is after putting that comic book down, like what you feel, like, did it make you feel something? Did it take you someplace? And, yeah. you know, that isn't always contingent on the amount of line work or, you know, how, like a Hal Foster page certainly takes you someplace, but so does a, a you know, a, a Darwin story right. for that matter. Um, 
who's to say one's better or not? Um, yes. Well, I, you know, I think it's interesting because your process or your journey as an artist kind of encompasses some of that because, you know, you had the traditional sort of house styles, then the image guys came along, and that was really about a lot of detail. That's what people yeah. really no, I, liked. I, it was just like piling, the more detailed you piled, that meant that it was good because you put detail. Yeah. And so like coming out of that to seeing guys like Tim Sale or Darwin or anybody that's working in a, a, mm -hmm. a clearer or t like Toth goes totally. Oh, yeah, Toth was who I was looking for. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Um, and now we're sort of in a, in a in a place where the mainstream style can embrace that because I don't I think those guys who just love detail, there's still some of them. But they're not the majority of the people who buy comics now. Yeah, I think it's very appealing. I, I had I was always trying to break down systems and figure out things. And my idea of if you had the perfect comic book artist that appealed to the fan, like the super fan, um, like the fan of the '90s that right. still exists today, but in a different form. <laughs> I think fans, especially young fans, love seeing detail. There's just something. There's just yeah. something magic about it. You can get lost. In details and i think it's because yeah. and this is going to sound like an old man talking but w when you see all the when you're younger everything is new your senses are taking in everything and you're exploring more. <laughs> the older the older you get you're you're, you're more comfortable with uh, your environment maybe i'm getting a little too philosophical but i think there's a reason why we gravitate towards like bernie bernie wrightson or like a, a crazy terry austin page or um, you know, Arthur Adams, it's just, it's, he creates a world and, and you get sucked into it. So I always thought the perfect amalgamation, the perfect comic book artist would be if Frank Miller laid out and did layouts and you had Arthur Adams coming in and doing finishes. It was a, it was a weird combination, but I thought like in the nineties, I'm like, if I could do something like that, then maybe <laughs> I would be this, I would be the next Jim Lee, you know? Well, you know, <laughs> Thing is though, what works with Frank's stuff is the speed at which you read it. Yeah, well, that's that's it's a different it's a different animal. So I thought, yeah. how weird would that be to see this really just you know obviously genius, brilliant storytelling accompanied with this intense, um, you know, the intensity that Arthur Adams brings to everything he touches. Yeah, yeah, and then you would explode. Well, yeah. Well, that's why. That's why you see my style is now just very scratchy and chaotic. Yeah. I can't. Uh, I can't. I can't ink. I mean, I guess I could ink like that. I think I could ink like that for a couple pages, but I probably want to blow my brains out. You know. I have a. a I have a question, real quick, it, which is it's going to go in a little bit into your uh, present, Dan, and we can always come back. Oh. Uh, but Gar, Gar asked, "Hey, Gar, how are you?" Uh, question, how do you balance your work day, splitting time between writing, penciling, and inking assignments, question mark? Is this pre-COVID or uh, present COVID? Let's say pre and then do present. Okay. How's that? Well, I always, because I, I, I'm i writing a, I'm writing two books that I'm not drawing, and I'm, I'm drawing two different books generally. And it's, it's, I would not recommend that at all. I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not a good it's not a good idea. I always try to break up my days and say, I have a good plan starting out, and I certainly have a great plan right before I go to bed for the following day. And it always involves me, you know, waking up early, working on a certain thing to a certain amount of time, and then switching gears. And I think I can switch gears okay, but um, now I've just time has taught me just do one thing a day. So so yes, the last two days was just writing. And then the rest of the week is all is all drawing. I, I just can't I, I can't juggle it really. I've I've been trying and it's just you know, you you know. So you feel like I, your brain goes into like certain modes, you have a writing brain and a drawing brain. No, I, I think I think when you finish an app like an assignment that your body wants to take a break or your mind wants to take a break rather and, and you're just right. like, well, I'm done. I finished the writing. So now I get to, and it's like, no, you're not done. Now you have a, a full work day of drawing and it's, um, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. 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 How, how, what, and, and you have a family. So yeah. Like, so was a maniac. Right. So and how old are you? Know, four or five? He's six. I was telling Jamar, this is my favorite coffee cup. Um, horror. It's, 
you know, the worst colors. It's horrible looking. But I like the favorite. bloody the bloody handprint. That's nice. It's yeah, nice it's his his bloody it, it, with him. This kid, <laughs> this kid is like um, Eunice the Untouchable. Um, he feels no pain whatsoever. Um, yes, yeah, so he's like a human wrecking machine. Um, uh, I have an I have another question. Oh, so our good buddy J. Robert Deans, hey J. R. D. Says, Dan, do you think you finally found your art style, small tweaks aside, or do you feel you're still learning slash evolving? I think I've, I think I've settled in pretty good to the, the style I'm doing right now. I feel like it's unique enough that, you know, it's, I, I, it's certainly in a family of, of other artists, you know, it's very influenced by Klaus and a um, mm. uh, bunch of other inkers it's heavy on the ink style i think that that makes makes up most of the style but like we were talking about darwin i i can't tell you how many times i bother my wife with just mentioning how much i would love to be able to simplify my work and distill it down and just i just you know what i'll be honest i don't think the drawing is strong enough on its own to not need that veneer of um polish i guess when it, when it comes to the ink Otherwise, I'd, I'd have, or maybe I just don't have the right assignment yet, where I, I feel like this this particular book can get away with a, attempting a um, uh, a uh, more open style. You know, it's it's well, you know, simple. People think simple is easy, but it's not. It's it's yeah. harder. It's yeah. really tough. I was going to say earlier, Dan, that you could uh, you could start doing four or five pages a day if you spend a month working them out first. Yeah, it's like Mike Mignola. I remember I asked him. Yeah. You know, he's he's like he spends more time just on that thumbnail than he does drawing the actual page. Yeah. You know, he's mm -hmm. and it, it shows. That's why there. Remember, I remember Mike. Remember when we were, uh, you know, doing the Quasar. So many people were 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 trying. They were just starting to read like Cosmic Odyssey, and they'd seen Gotham by Gaslight. Maybe that, and they were right. really the artists themselves. Even though Mike wasn't as commercial as he would become later. The artists were all like, "Oh my God, this guy's awesome," and they were trying to trying to emulate what he did. Um, even even like masterful artists like uh, Tom Grinberg was was a, was doing a Mignola style at the time, and you know, and Tom is exceptional. You can see what he, he does today on Facebook, and you put something up, and you go, "Wait a minute, was that was that from you know creepy or a Warren book from you know 50 years ago?" It's like, no, my you know Tom just did that last week, but. Um, but everybody was trying to do that, but it you, you just, you know, to, to, to what we were saying about composition, that goes a long way. Storytelling and comp composition primarily, like where those figures are on the panel, how the panel's looked at. Like Mignola will rarely ever move the camera from eye level. It's usually right at eye level, like you're like you're a, a cinematographer in a movie that is, doesn't have a, a crane available. You're just, you're, you're doing a handheld or you have it set on a tripod and it's, he's very specific in that way. And it's just, it's the negative shapes and um, how he carves out the, the black on a page, you know, it's masterful and you just can't, you just, it's not less, it's not less as easier. It's less as harder really if, as an artist. I mean, I think you could probably, you would almost in a way have to create a style board for yourself where you would have to work it out. You'd have to take time and work out how you want, you know, do you want feathering from the black into the white, or is it just a contour line with the black popped on, which is sort of a way, a basic way of doing it, because everybody sort of does that. It kind of comes out of like what Kniff and those guys are doing in the old days. You'd have a thin contour and then a black, you know, indicating a shadow or something. But there was very little rendering into from the dark, which guys like Sinnott or Palmer or Klaus. Frank Robbins, Frank Frank Robbins, Robbins would have a more rendering and Yeah. So uh, I think that you would you would almost have to spend time working on design, just like you do in a film, right? When you when you're working on a film, an animated film, they have designers and then they kind of amalgam all that stuff together. Even if it's Disney or Miyazaki or whatever, to Mike, if you don't mind, I'd like to be I'd like to be the only one using the word amalg amalgamation. Okay, all right. <laughs> I give I that. Mean, 
I give them, you have to give I them five to clubs. Like argue, you know, <laughs> <with the> clubs. <laughs> I, can't remember, I can't remember the director, but I, there's this thing that's been in Hollywood for years where someone was talking to a director and they were asking him for basic good advice. And he said, point the camera at the story. <laughs> that is great advice, Jeez. Yeah. The script description of what Darwin did. Because I, I love Darwin. I have my favorite work of his is the Parker stuff. Yeah, me too. I have all that here, and I've what I've noticed is I cannot study his artwork because I always end up reading. See, that's that's magic right there. And the same with Mike Mignola's. You know, it's the same thing. I I try to look at it just as artwork, but before I, you know, you just can't help. It. There's so much compelling. Uh, you get swept away. Drama information, and it's nothing but that. I mean, yeah. Mike's more concerned about being beautiful in his you know, mm -hmm. decorative way he renders everything. And Darwin just wanted to make sure you were feeling it. I remember he said one time that uh, he said something like, uh, the dramatic impact of the story has nothing to do with how well the guy's thumbnails are going. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I Guys, I have uh, some inking questions for Dan from the room. So these are going to be two right on top of each other, Dan. So feel free to make it quick. Sorry, I'm so long. I get all excited talking to you guys. I love, I mean, this is all I live for is just jabbering <laughs> about artwork. So no, this is this is why yeah. we get paid the big bucks, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah the big bucks. Yeah. All right. So Gar is the MVP today. He's coming through with all the dope. Gar's an awesome guy that, that's always there for us at Drink and Draw. And it, it kind of. Poking, poking fun at us and having a good time. He's, he's a great fella. All right, here's the first question, and then you can answer, and I'll follow up with the second one. Question right. from Dan. What's the most common mistake you see from people learning and, and or working on inking? Uh, I think that you have to really, even if you have a deadline style, you still have to be aware of where that light source is. Um, and it, it, it even, you want that, top line let's say you know we're inking that that ball or that um yeah the ball you want that top part with the lights hitting to be the thinnest the bottom part to be the darkest um and also with the feathering you know if the light's coming up from here the feathering should be angled to where that to where that light is because it's you can think of it as rays of light that are spearing through the black and um i think it's a it's a mistake sometimes and i think you'll see a, a beginning inker maybe not mentally, you know, maybe the penciler by accident didn't um, do the hatching. Like he had a light source, but then he's, he's really not following it. Maybe he's on autopilot, you know, deadlines, it can be crazy. But as an anchor, you know, you need to be aware of those things. And sometimes, you know, being, being aware of how light hits an object. And so if you have, um, it, it's hard to have feathering on both sides of an object, really. Um, but you see that pretty often. And um, I don't know, I, those, those are little weird little things that I, I notice when it comes to inking. But obviously, you want to be able to master your tool tools, number one, and have, con have as much control as possible over them. But the biggest thing is understanding what you're drawing and understanding that everything has um, form. You know, you want... Um, you want a dark shadow under a nose or a chin. You know, you don't want to ink those so delicately um, that, you know, that the cheekbone, which certainly creates a shadow, it doesn't, it's not going to create as much shadow as underneath your nose. And sometimes people will put like harsh, you know, cheekbone lines and that becomes the, the, the thickest maybe ink line. And that's, you know, that's a little bit of a, a drawing mistake. And in, in this case, an inking mistake. But if you're aware of where the light's coming from, it, uh, half your job is done right there. Uh, next part of the question is Gar again, Gar. Oh. Would you ever consider having another artist ink your pencils? And if so, who would you choose to ink your work? Uh, One more, and then we'll get back to the comments. <laughs> I'd have, I mean, I'd have Dave Johnson ink me or any any professional artist inker. I, I wouldn't give him necessarily to a regular inker because my pencils are garbage. They just look like... Um, scratchy layout. You know that how to draw more Marvel comics the Marvel way that, where John Buscema does that scribbly Thor mm -hmm. and then he refines it and he finds all the best lines. Well, that's how my pencils look because I'm I'm just rushing through them and I'm not very confident as a penciler. So when I put on the inking hat, I'm switching gears and I'm, I'm imagining like I've, I've been given 
pencil given someone's given me somebody else's pencils and I'm fixing them, but really I'm um so my You're I, I don't think anybody could ink my pencils really because they're they're not really they're just more like notes to myself in a way. Mm -hmm. Uh okay. And so you're drawing when you ink. I'm drawing when I ink. I, it saves me a lot of time, and I think that's why I can. I can. It, hopefully, they're coming out very spontaneous looking in, in spots, and yeah. I. I guess it's a speed thing too. Uh, Julian says to Dan, "When you're inking, do you create your own black? Maybe ink with acrylic, pigments, charcoal, etc., or with coffee." Uh, I've been using. Uh, I've been maybe. using this Eon uh, Vortex ink. Well, hold on. Uh, let me give you the screen. You want to hold oh. it? Uh, Eon Vortex is that made by Elon Musk? Yeah, Elon got into that. He's done with solar tiles, and now he's like, ink is the way to go. I'm going to make a fortune on it. Um, but yeah, I use I usually use that. Um, if I really have time, I'd like to, I'd like to come in and, and and spot all the blacks and do the heavy blacks first. I think that's the proper way to do a page is to either um, I, I think anchoring those places on a page with ink. But you know, nine times out of ten, I'm just going in with one of these. This is a um, this is a Kurataki PK12 okay. or ten rather, mm -hmm. and um, I'll go in and basically outline everything and then fill in black, which is doesn't give you as good of an effect, but it's it's obviously a time saver. Time. time. Everybody's always fighting time. Yes, <laughs> you're a cartoonist. You know, I mean, I guess unless you're doing a graphic novel, you have longer, like you're, I'm assuming the stuff you're doing for Europe, you probably, what, a year out or something? Uh, unfortunately for the publisher, yes. <laughs> it's taken me, it's taken me, it's taken me a year um, to, to get uh, to, there's a, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll end with this story. This is, this is terrible. And I can see Brett already laughing, but it's, um, it goes back to this Darwin thing. I got this big assignment to do this, um, adapt this novella. And I thought to myself, now I'm going to become Darwin. I'm going to simplify my style and do something just dramatic. And, and I couldn't arrive on a style. I couldn't pull the trigger. And I just kept eating up time, eating up time. Months went by and I didn't turn anything in. And meanwhile, the editor is asking me, granted, I have other work where I'm doing the style that I, I normally draw in. And I'm like this. This thing I'm going to make special, and I and I go. It's also going to be fast because I'm not going to be drawing as much. I'm just going to be relying on, um, you know, composition. And of course, I ate up all that time. And if I would have drawn it in the style I draw in, it would have been done by now. And ultimately, finally, I just said, look, I can't eat up this this editor's time anymore. This is insane. I have to deliver this book. So let me just draw <laughs> start drawing it and i did and uh so maybe it has a little bit less detail but it's basically still drawn the same way i, I typically draw it, it and I, I just have to accept that that's what it's going to be until i magically you know none of us magically have like oh, i'm going to take a year off and find out who i am as an artist <laughs> it's not going to happen so Dan, how much there's an ongoing fantasy that somehow once you've learned enough craft you should be able to become any type of artist you want to be. Yeah. But it, it doesn't work that way. You only have one friend. Yeah. But then again, if I could I could draw like you, Brett, I would just be like, well, no, that's you know, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, man. Yeah, I, no, I'm I well, I love I love those like especially when you just do those pencil renderings. I have a I have a Frazetta up here that kind of reminds me of, of your your work because it's just there's just a lushness to it and I, I, this is a strange word, but like there's a whimsy to the work that that you you can't teach someone. It's just mm -hmm. either there or it isn't there. Or maybe it's a confidence or something. I don't know, but mm -hmm. it's, it's beautiful. Personality. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I, uh, I have to, as I said before, it had never occurred to me to pencil a book and color that as the finished book. Oh, I think you'd you'd slay at that. That would be amazing. It would save time. Yeah, and you. Uh, yeah, it would. It would save time, and I think it would look possibly even better. Well, yeah. when I was yeah. talking about the wishing or you know planning, hoping you can come up with another style. I thought once I started working in animation, and you adapt to the style of the show, um, and then uh, that didn't seem to be too difficult. Whether you know, I worked for Disney and worked on the X Men and 
Warner yeah. Brothers. Right? Warner, up Warner Brothers. Well, that's the base, and then I did this other stuff. But oh. then when I started working for um, Disney Publishing, I did all this stuff with mm -hmm. Tinkerbell and Wreck It Ralph and Toy Story and all this stuff, and you get the model sheets and you can draw in that world. But to come up with one myself, there's just too many options or something. You know what I mean? It's like it's very yeah. hard. What about when you did Pirates of the Caribbean? Well, that wasn't based on any uh, pre-existing design. It had to be you, right? Yeah, it was just. Uh, well, first we were doing comics about uh, Jack Jack Sparrow Pirates. Yeah. yeah. And then they uh, they did come up with a style that was very very strange, angular, distorted style. It was oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. It was not appealing at all. I don't know why they decided to do it. And I told the editor uh, that I really didn't, you know, I wasn't interested in, in drawing in that style. So uh, he asked if there was anything else I wanted to do. He, I said, how about the Scarecrow of Romney Marsh? She didn't know about. And they, the characters existed at the same time. So we did one story where they met. And then we switched and did a bunch of Scarecrow of Romney Marsh stories, which I painted. And that was a lot of fun. They were short. You know, like eight page stops. But, uh, yeah. What about I, the Skybound stuff? Was that inked? That was ink and wash. When I was thinking about what you said, it would have been much easier to do it with pencil. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you, would you would you put wash? You could put possibly just put the wash right over the uh, pencil, right? Yeah, or just smear it with a you know, smear the graphite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I took. Uh, I was. I had, when I started that book, I had. Uh, recently become a widower, so I was, I remember. my head was so screwed up, it took me forever to finish it. Um, but I really enjoyed it, just, mm -hmm. I kept making tons of mistakes, I couldn't concentrate, so finally we took it. They were incredibly patient, we got it all. Yeah, they're, they're very patient over there. It took me, it took me a, a long time to do slots, and then finally I got on a schedule, and I, I just had to go into autopilot, and I think I did the last three issues in three months somehow. You know, it's weird. You can do it when there's a, you know, there's a gun to your head. But if, yeah. if, if you give an artist too much time, he's going to waste all of it, I think. I mean, at least I'm, <laughs> I'm the type of guy who will. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny because a lot of the artists that we admire produce some of our favorite work of theirs under the most adverse conditions, right? I mean, they were having to sit down and blast out, you know, pages and pages a day, you know, um, and I think you sort of, you train yourself in a way. I mean, there for a while, you know, like being in in monthly comics is like being a cage fighter. You got to tape that knee and get right back. You would get what? A week? Well, you have to go on instinct, I think. You, you, I mean, it's like you can teach yourself all these skills, but if you overthink anything, it just gets stiff and uh, belabored. But if you have to just go on instinct alone, I think that's... I mean, I wouldn't recommend like wasting all your time until the last minute. But if you have to go on instinct, the arts the art's going to be a lot more freeing. It's going to be a lot more loose. It's going to be more spontaneous. There's quite possibly more energy in, in the well, work. Well, I think your I think your work now. I mean, following from your from what you were doing even like four or five years ago, I think it's much looser, and you can see the evolution of. Because I think whether you feel more confident as a penciler, it comes out more confident. Thanks. I, I am getting more. I am getting more confident. But it's like we were talking about: the more you, the more you know, the uh, the more there is to know, I guess. And um, yeah, it's just it's it's very humbling these days. Seeing, I mean, imagine some of these talents uh back 20 30 years ago like if they, they took a time machine and just showed up uh, you know almost an average comic book artist today would be a, a superstar out of nowhere in some cases i mean the, the difference being of course being monthly because you can't you couldn't fool around <laughs> you know that that's something too like those that those generations a couple generations ago were, were producing monthly work at an exceptional level i don't know it's all it it's it's well that's i mean that's funny because technology from when we started people weren't even faxing yet or had just started faxing and now we're tweeting and you know i mean it's like instantaneous we went from 12 week hot week deadline you know 12 weeks the book was on fire down to you finish today 
next Wednesday, it's like, yeah, you know, well, that's Marvel. Right. Mar Marvel was like that. You'd be finished, and then one week later, or a week and a half later, it'd be on the stands. At least, at least DC back in in the nineties, they had a three month. Um, you know. Right. right. Yeah. 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 So, um, and I, did, did you do uh, talk about like some of the illustrators you started looking at to pull your for for your inspiration? Is there guys well, you're looking at when I um when so I went through that John Byrne phase is probably like a. Uh, high, in high school pretty heavily but when i started looking at comics and really getting into them it was joe kubert um john buscema and like walt simonson guys like that and so i think when i kind of my dad passed away and i um got out of comic books for about 10 years and like i was saying working in advertising and all sorts of you know video games storyboards all sorts of weird mediums um those were the artists that kind of came to the, the forefront. Um, what we're saying was they just kind of came out as opposed to me, the Jim Lee side that I had learned in the right. image days. I, I like I like telling people my influence was was Jim Lee because it was so far from looking close to Jim Lee that they go, oh, was it Jim Lee or was it you know somebody else? Because you know, <laughs> but but yeah, so all those artists came out and then guys like Bill Ray. Um, were very influential as far as like showing me different artists um, um, that were outside of comics, but were illustrators. And um, you don't hear from them much at all, but Mark Pacella, uh, also you know, Mark and Bill were good friends and Mark had a lot of, um, you know, he was very knowledgeable in, um, in varied arts. And so, you know, to me, it was, you know, I didn't, I, I was so unknowledgeable that I didn't realize that John Byrne was like, you know, kind of more of a, you know, he was obviously very inspired by Neil Adams. I, I couldn't even make that connection necessarily. Really? Um, you know, so, uh, yeah. Who, I, I, who do you look at? Who do you look at now? Do you look at painters or illustrators or what, what, do, what do you? I like um, my, James Montgomery Flagg quite a bit because it is he's kind of got a brash inking style um i, I like him uh who else uh Gib, gibson same thing the, the, those mr pip books do you remember you remember those yeah they're i have the huge original ones they're they're super oversized and uh they're pretty funny i mean they're for, for that time period those red covers yeah. yeah i've got those too see if i i actually i'll bring one over here real quick so guys, we're going to start wrapping Dan because uh, we're on a different time zone, and also he's on deadline. So if anybody has any last questions, for oh Dan, wow, nice. yeah, that's it. Yeah. yeah. So let's see. Um, have you ever have you seen his originals? Yeah, I have. I've seen a few of them. And oh, I mean, it's just, let's yeah. see. I mean, obviously, you guys don't need. You can go online and, and look at this stuff, but right, yeah. Um, it's just, I mean, talk about a, a, a great, uh, penciler and, and inker. I mean, and just such bravado in the way he would just throw down, um, paint. And I don't know, Mike, is that paint or, or is that, um, crow quill or something? No, that's, those are old crow quill. That's old, the old crow quills. And if like you a see gelat or something. Yeah. Yeah. And if you see the way the. The guy, he basically was creating, it was drawn like you were painting. It was like a tone. Yeah. You know, really thinking of form uh, as opposed to, because it's like halfway between painting and say somebody like Franklin Booth. Yeah. Who's you know, nuts. yeah. You know, who did all his stuff because he thought that that was all done by by hand he didn't know it was yeah, breathing yeah yeah i know that's that's what's crazy and then you got people like um <laughs> like wrightson and now frank cho um i yeah. mean going that's all franklin franklin booth inspired it's really yeah. cool yeah yeah it's funny if the guy like frank cho is manages to do a great job of it i mean he's he's like a machine with, i'd like to Martin. strangle frank cho but, um, <laughs> you know what's remarkable well, uh, Frank, too, is he, you know this, I'm sure he does all that with markers. Yeah, with markers. Yeah. Which seems to me to be 10 times harder than using a flexible nib, and yet he gets the same effects. He's nuts, though. So there's that. 
Dan, how you doing for time? Do we need to get you out of here? Uh, whatever you guys feel like wrapping up, I, I, I keep listening to hear if my, my son and we'd all hear if my son and uh, wife came home. <laughs> I have a couple of questions from the room and then we'll start to play you out. So this is a publisher question, Dan. It's a little oh. spicy, so you oh. can a- answer at your own peril. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bill asks, Dan, why did you go to Boom Studios instead of, say, Image or Dark Horse or even Skybound? Um, well, I worked with Skybound, uh, doing slops and they were, they were the first, um, publisher. I mean, it's image comics, but it's Robert Kirkman's company is Skybound. They were the first guys to, Robert kept offering me books to draw and unbeknownst to me, he was offering me like books that he was actually writing, but he never told me he was going to be the writer. He would just Mm -hmm. go, what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. And I'd go, nah, you know, I want to write and draw my own. And he's like, okay. So finally he just gave in. And he'd let me write and draw my own when nobody else would, because I've been pitching. I've been pitching comic book companies for, for a few years um, to do my, write my own things, but Robert was the first one to let me do that. But I pitched them after slots wrapped up. I had pitched them a bunch of different things that I was interested in doing, and editorially, um, they wanted to make some changes on the stuff, and I, I felt pretty strong about what I wanted these stories to be. So um, Boom is a local publisher also, just like Skybound. And I know um, a lot of the guys over there and girls and um, they, you know, I bounced a bunch of ideas off them and they just said, we'll take it. And um, I mean, you know, in this game, you gotta, you gotta go with who you go with. And um, Boom has been fantastic. I have a fantastic editor, this guy, uh, Matt Levine, who's working with me on um, a book I'm writing called An Unkindness of Ravens. And Amy, uh, it's it's been great. I mean, uh, I don't I don't really have any problems with any different publishers. It's uh, I think different publishers can bring different. They're they're good for different things. Like I think Skybound primarily would be is is great if you're going to be doing a horror book because people are going you're going to Robert Kirkman because you love Walking Dead or maybe you know you might also love Invincibles. Maybe I'm. See, this is mm-hmm. this is how my loony mind works. But um, you know, obviously, Walking Dead is is his bread and butter, and I think TV and film and maybe even comic book people associate him with Walking Dead, and maybe and Boom isn't necessarily a superhero company, and the stuff I write and draw sometimes isn't really superhero stuff. So Boom was kind of a natural fit mm-hmm. for that, and I, I got another project with AWA that I'm writing, um, and they're more of um, it's kind of like a crime noir or supernatural sort of um, slant or bent that they publish. So all these projects, they have, they have, they can find a home and it's, it's not necessarily always, you know, going to be the home that you worked in last. Right. All right. Here's my last one for you, Dan, and you're off the hook. Okay. All right. Gar comes in to clean up. <laughs> Question for all, but I'm going to give this to you, Dan. This is something okay. to take us home with. Any techniques, tips for when a piece or just a blank page is fighting you? How do you push past that? Um, Thanks, Gar. You're the MVP tonight, Gar. I use the old deadline thing. The more I I force myself to get that page done each day. So um, we used to talk about this in the drawing room all the time about like learning, learning from your mistakes and finishing that page learning from the mistake and, and trying to apply what you learn to the next one and not necessarily drawing the same panel over six times, which I've done, which I'm sure everybody does. But I think it's, I think you sometimes just got to push past it. You got to force yourself. Obviously you can take a break here and there, but um, push past it. And tomorrow is going to be a different day for me. How about, how about you guys? I'd like, I'm kind of curious. Sometimes I do crazy things like try to draw with my left hand. Oh God! And that totally flips your brain upside down. You can't control it. Uh-huh. Maybe if you're really tired and you're in a grind, you sort of like you say you're trying to redo it, but you keep just repeating what you had already there because you're stuck in this rut. If you, when I draw with my left hand, I can't even make a mark without total concentration, so it knocks me out of that group. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah, I, I I find it amazing when you're like, let's say you get stuck on a face or or a hand. Yeah, you've maybe drawn a hundred times before. You know how to draw it. It's just you can't get that face right 
for no matter how many times you do it and you it's almost like a broken record you keep skipping and skipping and skipping and it's, it's hard to get out of that rut sometimes yeah. you almost just have to go let's pick a whole different angle because today for whatever reason a profile is a mystery you know and sometimes that solution is so obvious that you maybe it should have been the first thought so when you yeah. finally get it you realize why you were wasting time because your subconscious were telling you. Yeah, I try to be zen. I try to be zen about it. I'm like, there's a reason for everything in the universe, and I'm not supposed to draw it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 uh, I think because of the strips and having to constantly produce, there's just some, there's some panels that I just call it's a gimme. It's not, it's not going to be beautiful, but you got to get past it to get to the next yeah. one. Totally. Because, you know, if you, if you, you know, you could uh, erase it, you could put it, you could flip it over, draw it backwards. It, oh, okay. You know, you could take a picture. You could, you could look for some swipe or something that was kind of similar thing. Or sometimes you just do it and you go past it because every artist, you know, every artist you love has stuff that to go, man. Oh, I remember when I drew that, that's a piece of, that's a turd. That, that one, you know, you just, you got to blow through it, you know? It's funny. I'm sure we all do it. But every time I look through a book, I can just see all the bad pages and all the bad panels. And that's the only thing I see, you know? Yeah. yeah. How about you, Jamar? Uh, I keep, um, I have this like very big kind of like a, a poster I've been working on uh, for Detective Boogaloo for maybe six years. Wow. And I've never finished it. So every time I get stuck on something I should be doing, I noodle on that. So it's How almost like it's, uh, it's two spreads. So it's like two 11 by 17s taped together. Mm -hmm. And it's just like this. So I noodle on some faces and then I go back to work. Uh, so that's it helps me out. Once Is that in a while. your 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 Dorian Gray <laughs> <laughs> yeah. over in the the corner, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. It'll yeah. never get finished, but yeah. it's, it's yeah. there for me to cry on. So it's full yeah. of full of teardrop stains. It's bad. <laughs> it's all warped. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that helps break that rut. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's helpful for me. And then just kind of like cool. looking at something that you know I know is just not not there yet, rather than what I need to do today, kind of gives me a little bit of gear shift for for the night you know yeah i mean you it, it's funny because you 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 have to produce anybody who's going to make your living doing comics you have to produce a volume of work unless you're finally get to that rarefied position where you have you know pre you've got a library of stuff that continues to sell enough that you get big fat royalty checks or something but i'm gonna start crying mike yeah, you know, you have to, like you said, you got to produce at least a page a day, almost. Yeah. 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 You know, yeah. Um, yeah. good, good or, good or bad. And you know, it's funny. You're right. When a book comes out, you look through it and you go, ah, oh, mm, mm, you see. But t if you go look at something you did ten years ago, you don't feel as bad about it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because the whole book looks awful. <laughs> <laughs> you just have to, it's a walk away. You just get to walk around. So, all right, Dan, uh, thank you so much. I don't know where the time's going. Uh, it was a pleasure chopping it up with you, my friend. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Uh, are, you in are you in California, Dan? Yeah, I'm in L.A. We're in the same time zone, man. So we still oh, okay. Where are you? Portland? I'm in Arizona. Oh, cool. From the mountain. We're not cool, really. We're burning up. <laughs> not cool. Uh, I'm over a lot high. It's, it's actually probably about 72 degrees. Oh, perfect. Ooh, bomby. Nice. So, so uh, uh, do you have a drink and draw? Your drink and draws are what? Thursday? Thursday. Tomorrow we're going to take a, a day off, but uh, we'll be back next week. We're going to have Ron Garney on, but uh, you saw what happened to that guy. Yeah, what he blew up his his uh, his. Uh, he, he started to grill, and the whole thing it's only only Ron could survive an explosion. You know, he's he all right. Uh, his whole side, he told me, was um, burned. He's like in bandages. Oh my gosh! So but the he, tank he's blew up. Fine. He's like Wolverine. He'll be. He'll be okay. So what happened? The tank blew up while he was grilling. Is that? What I don't know. He threw the match in. I guess maybe there was. A, maybe it was leaking a little bit. So there was yeah. already uh, propane mm -hmm. or gas. I guess I don't know. But it's, it was like. 
yeah, I think it's the whole side of him just, you know, oh my goodness. I don't think it's third degree burns or anything, but he had to go to the hospital. Hey, any burns suck. Yeah, I've had, I, I've had, I've had pretty bad burns uh, before and it is painful. I had it on my hand. Um, I won't get into how because it was typical uh, Dan stupidity, but um, it wasn't an accident. Let's put it that way. This is not nitroglycerin. Yeah, let's shake this up. It's like Wiley Here's Coyote. Dan, I know, I, was, I know I said I was going to let you go, but I just had a question and maybe for all of us. The, does making your living, I'm acting like I don't do this too, but does making a living using your hands ever make you think twice about the things you're doing in your life? They you should, know? but apparently they don't with me. So I've injured, I constantly manage my hands. I, I, I box to stay in shape and I'll box, I never wrap. Um, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll box barehanded because I keep going, it'll toughen me up just like my, my dad. And um, like that hand injury, I, I had been drinking too much and I reached inside a fire pit to pick up a, a burning coal on a dare. Like who does that? I mean, it's just an idiot. It's, it's, you know, yeah, just idiot stuff. Maybe it's my way of going, well, if I can't draw, then maybe I, you know, I do something else. <laughs> wow. It's like me, it's like me with eating. I, that's, that's my thing. Like if I'm eating, I can't, I can't draw. And I, you know, I have to sit, I have to get away from the desk. And so that's right. That's my vice. <laughs> just so you have a giant plate of meat behind you somewhere so it's rock, it's I, did have, I did have steak today yeah <laughs> oh my gosh well I, right, hope, I hope you uh, <laughs> hear something on your noggin when you're back well you didn't risk that <laughs> <laughs> Dan uh, give a plug for drink and draw or in oh, your social um, media and, and what's what's new on shelves um, what, let's, see, let's see if I can do it here correctly um, obviously I can't um, I was going to say everything is Urban Barbarian. It's um, at Urban Barbarian on Twitter and at Urban Barbarian on Instagram. And if you want to listen to Dave Johnson, uh, Jeff Johnson, Joe Casada, and Ben DeFeo and I, uh, typically every week we're on uh, the original Drink and Draw Social Club YouTube channel. And uh, is there a fake Drink and Draw out there? Well, we're the first ones. We're the first ever Drink and Draw. Um, we started it in LA and um, it just went out from there. Wasn't well, there a Philly chapter at one point? There's probably there's chapters everywhere around the country now and all over the world. It's it's nuts. Do they have to um, pay dues to you? What? Is there tribute? Do they have to pay tribute? Yeah, do they have to pay tribute to you? We everybody always wants to try to. We do have a drink and draw a trademark though, but um, you need it, the franchise, right? Yeah, I, I mean, everyone's like, well, you should, you could be making a fortune on that. And, and the reason we started doing Drink and Draw is it's just like the reason everybody does Drink and Draw, just to hang out with other artists, socialize, because, you know, it's not a very social job we have unless you're, even if you're in a studio, your head's to the grindstone. But mm -hmm. um, it gives artists an opportunity to, to hang out with other artists and possibly meet people that aren't artists. Because, as, you know, if you've ever been to a bar sketching, um, it's like you're in a rock band. People want people are looking to start conversations. They're at a bar because, you know, they want to be social. They want to get out and they see someone doing something interesting and it's a conversation starter. So mm. um, we never wanted to make money on it or charge admission to a drink and draw or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and we still don't. Yeah. You but, had a I remember you had a book that came out. Like yeah, we had a couple. We had one from Image and one from IDW. We're going to probably do another Kickstarter or Indiegogo or something and um, do another volume, all the stuff that we've collected from doing the um, the YouTube channel. And we're going to try to see if other drink and draw chapters around the world wanted to contribute. And so it could be kind of an international thing. And then, you know, we have all sorts of big plans, but whenever they involve drinking, you know, where those plans go. <laughs> if you, if you can't remember you, them. Yeah, the next cool step. <laughs> if you put all those drink and draw chapters together in one place, it'll be like that scene in the Warriors. Where all that the could be are... that could be <laughs> like the Warriors, or it could just be an amazing comic book convention. Um, yeah, uh, no, you might be yeah. on something. A drink and draw I mean, comic show. You have, to, you have to drink to get in, though. Yeah. <laughs> Smell your breath. All right, you can go. In. <laughs> it's funny. A lot of those, a lot of those in, um, introductions in the drink and draw books. I would say nine out of ten of the people that did the introductions for us, like Kirkman and. And others, they don't drink, so it was kind of ironic that they would be writing like for us on these on these books. 
funny. Well, I notice you don't seem to drink when I watch it. You don't. You're you you're not like look look look. You know, like a with a Jack Daniels. Yeah, but I, I mean, I some of them about half and half I do. Um, but you know, it is in the middle middle of the day generally. I um, I like drinking. Thing. I'm I'm more of a social drinker. I like to go to a, an actual bar. I I I'm not. I, I don't drink at home really. I drink coffee all day. Mm. Cheers to that. A yeah. sip of coffee for that. Yes, right. But if I'm at a bar, then it's you know then it's a little too much drinking, mm -hmm. and then the hand gets burned and. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Yeah. Then I'm in our right. school. All right, Dan, I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much, brother, Thanks, for coming Dan. on. Thanks, you guys. It was Thanks. great seeing you all again. And uh, I can't wait to see the next episode you guys put together. Yeah. Will do. Thanks, bro. I'll see you soon. Cheers. Cheers. Good night. Bye, Dan. Bye. Bye, Brett. See ya. I kicked him out. <laughs> Yeah, that was great. Thanks so much for Dan uh, giving us some of his time. It's always great to catch up with our buds. And, you know, again, like I said earlier, it's been really fantastic to watch Dan's artistic journey continue. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah so that's from, so the wee, from the wee pup he was many years <laughs> ago. You know? uh, so, yeah, we have a little bit of time left. So uh, if anybody has any questions for us, feel free to ask. Please don't everybody hit yourself on the door on your way out. We still have more podcasts to go. Um, and uh, I can do a couple of uh, uh, plugs for our sponsors while we're taking a, taking a second. It sounds uh, like uh, sounds like Vietnam outside my house right now. Everybody's shooting off uh, like it's like the Tet Offensive or something. <laughs> uh, pencil to Pencil is brought to you by our sponsors, Clip Studio Paint, if you can see over my head. And also our good buddies over at Tomorrow's Publishing. Um, and coffee. Like I, and coffee. <laughs> I think we need a coffee sponsor. I think that's the we, nice we should get like uh, Wawa or Dunkin' Donuts or something like that. You know, like that. Yeah, I'll get on that. We need to get a letter writing campaign. And, you know, thanks again, everybody. We're not leaving yet. But thanks again for everybody who's been uh, spreading the word. Uh, I think our Twitter uh, thing has given us a lot of great signal boosting. Um, also, for the people watching on YouTube, uh, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, uh, our reach is starting to spread out like curvy hands. Um, and you know, looking at the analytics right now, it looks like the most most of our viewers, Mike and Brett, are coming from the YouTube channel. So that's great. Yeah, I, I figured that that's what would would sort of happen because that's where everybody kind of goes. I don't I mean StreamYard doesn't have a site, right? Yeah, so. right. Yeah, so our StreamYard, hey Matt, what's going on? Deathwish Coffee, yeah. I would like to get a sponsor, a coffee sponsor. Or Charles also, Bronson. Just get the real Death, the original Deathwish. <laughs> Charles, Charles, Charles Bronson. Charles Bronson's going to sponsor the podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, oh, there's some questions. Hey, Brett, there's a question for you. All right. Gar, Gar, the MVP of the evening. So it's a question for Brett. Have you put any time into digital tools? Have you liked any specific digital tools you've used? Thanks, Gar. I've done a lot of all digital work. I got my Cintiq in 2009. I mean, I'd done a little bit before that with what I now consider to be incredibly crude tools in Photoshop. You know, my first Photoshop was Photoshop 3, I think. Wow. Um, the paint. Once the Cintiq came in, though, I, I was using it for storyboards because uh, they had moved into entirely digital in a program called Storyboard Pro. But uh, because of my restlessness, I keep trying to find new ways of working. And I experimented with all kinds of combinations. For a long time, I uh, used uh, Sketchbook Pro. Love that. I love coloring in that. Um, I don't use Photoshop that often to actually do anything but put together work or maybe do a filter effect, because uh, I just find the interface so clumsy compared to uh, to Sketchbook Pro in particular. But I also use uh, St Manga Studio, uh, Clip Studio now, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what I use for most of the actual comic book type work, the yeah, line work, or inking. Brett, are you still, are you using like Manga Studio, one of the older versions of Clip Studio, or are you using the newer thing? No, it's a clip. I don't know what number it is, but it has the little bent paperclip looking emblem. Okay. I can find out. 
Oh, well, that's, that's not super important, but I was just wondering. So you, did, you did Stella using. Uh, the coloring was all Sketchbook Pro. But you, you, drew, you drew that traditional, right? Yeah. Listen, yeah. Uh, I would sometimes put, I put the star fields in digitally. That was actually in Photoshop. I found a bunch of uh, really high res deep space photos on the Hubble Space Telescope on the NASA site. So I'd use those, wow. found a, a filter effect in Photoshop that would lay the star field and compose it where you wanted it in your shot over whatever color background or dark or just black. And then I think it's called Lighten. I don't remember now, but it, it just uh, puts the light at uh, pixels onto whatever background was underneath. So everything disappears except the stars. Hmm. Um, my version is uh, Clip Studio Paint Pro version 1.5.4. Okay, yeah. You're in there. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't have to use the hang crank to, to start. Uh, there was no, a question my, from my Cintiq is from 2009, so it's definitely good. I'm surprised it's still, you, you don't have any dead pixels or anything yet. It's fine. No problem. I think mine is from earlier than that. It's like super old. <laughs> this one doesn't have a glass screen. And after a while, I noticed that the surface was getting slightly scuffed. So I taped it with acetate over. And it's been fine. The acetate can take all kinds of abuse. And I don't notice any difference in touch or but now they're glass, I think. Is that correct? The new ones have a glass surface? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, you know, as we talked about a, well, a, a little while ago, they're starting to create surface, almost like contact paper that you can lay over the, the screen to give you more of a grip or, you know, make a tooth. Hmm. So um, we can look into that. Hey, we, we should get that as a sponsor. All the sponsors. That's right. Does it, does it? You actually won't be able to see. <laughs> it's just gonna be it, dotted. Yeah, just just all the the the, the placards are sponsors. We'll, we'll, we'll That's great. The screen, you know. Um, um, go ahead, Mike. I was no, going no. to. I was going to look at who's coming up on our uh, future episodes, uh, but you guys talk talk amongst yourselves for a second. I'm going to pull that up. You're pulling up our list of. Yeah. Future All Stars. Yeah. Oh, also, uh, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if there are people that you would like us to get as guests, we always appreciate uh, the feedback. You can go to pencil to pencil .com, which is the home page of the podcast. We have a message board on there that people, mostly most of the people are asking our questions live as opposed to asking them during the show. But if you have other questions, it's good to either on our Facebook page or on the message board to suggest guests or you can ask us questions because we, we monitor it all the time. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, our, our, our legion of robots are, are scanning the, the forums at all times. Um, okay, yeah, I have it up. So, guys, just to remind you again, uh, we're taking uh, – fourth of july off so there will be no episode on saturday uh but uh after that we're going to go back into deep diving uh on wednesday the 8th man it's already the middle of july what happened <laughs> we just started what what happened did i get that wrong all right so on the 8th which is our wednesday show we're going to have uh uh Iconic uh, illustrator and comic book artist and master of the, the noir style, Sean Martinborough will be on. Uh, Sean uh, had a really long run on what uh, what is that book? Thief of Thieves, Thief of, Thief of Thieves for Skybound. Um, and then on the eleventh on Saturday, we're going to have Scott Christian Saba. Scott is an old friend, and uh, he's going to be promoting his new. Um, well, it's not new. But he has a, a film, uh, animated film coming out on Netflix called Animal Crackers, which uh, we've been pulling for for a long time. It kind of got mired in development hell, but it's coming out on Netflix at the end of this month. So really excited to talk to Scott. And Scott has um, an amazing presence on uh, uh, Instagram and Facebook. You should check out some of his work. Um, yeah, we, you know, we're just knocking him down. We got a murderer's row of talent, you guys. Uh, Mike, what do you think about our guests lately? They're murderers, all of them. 
<laughs> well, wait a minute. We're in the wrong culture to say that out loud. Oh, they're, all, they're killers. They're killing it, right? They're all yeah. killing. They're all killing, right? Is that the vena proper vernacular? They're all killing. Well, you know, you, you just said like, "Yo, you're killing it." They're killing the game right now. That's right. It. Right. Yeah. No, I, 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 I like the fact that we mix it up. We get people that are, you know, mainstream, and then doing animation, and then doing indie stuff. Uh, you know, it, gets, it, it really shows uh, how uh, wide the net, the whole art net spreads and how we're all sort of interconnected. Um, uh, Mimi was telling me earlier that there were something like 3,000 entries in the latest Webtoons uh, contest. Three, So that would be like 3,000 people sending in their Spider-Man book mm. to Marvel to to try to get a you know to get a to get a gig. I would hate to have to review that. <laughs> that would be the worst job in the world. But but again I'm always saying there's all these young artists out there who want who love the 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 vehicle of comics to tell their stories. So and they're you know they're not you know Spider Man or Superman or Batman but yeah, yeah. Uh, I just think that's I can't even I if someone had told me when I was, you know, 18, 19 and serious and trying to get in there, there was like 3,000 other people trying to get the same job. It would have like fried your mind. But mm. uh, I think it's it's what the awesome thing about it is that because of the web, there really is no uh, blockage to you being able to publish your work now and get an audience to look at your and just start getting feedback, yeah. you know, good, bad, indifferent, yeah. you know. So I think that's pretty. That's pretty amazing. Uh, there's a follow-up question for Brett, but I wanted to talk a little bit about that breaking ink thing for a second. Were both of you guys already in the business when the Marvel tryout book came out? Was that correct? No, it was before, right before I got in. Okay. What about you, Brett? You guys came in around the same time. I would. I started in '81. So I think it came out in 83 or 4. Mm -hmm. Or 82 uh, or something like that, I think. Yeah. Does any do, do, do you, either of you guys know of anybody that got into the business from that? I that like that like stuck to the wall. I I don't I don't the, the whole point was that somebody I think was supposed to get a you know they were going to you know look through all the stuff and then somebody like you you know you know, Jimmy Smith from Walla Walla, Washington. You, Me? you know, but I don't, I don't know if that ever, mm. came because I, I, it's, it's funny. I, I showed this on my Twitter and on my Facebook. I have a, I have a page because I bought it. I inking John Ramita. And that was probably, I think it was around 82, 83. Mm. And then um, I, yeah, my, Matt might be right. It might have been Mark Bagley. But anyway, I have a page, a trial page, which, of course, didn't get me any work. And then a couple years later, I was actually inking JR. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I ghosted some pages for, for, uh, for Al when he was inking. So it's funny. Just in a couple years, you went from, you know, having samples, showing the stuff, not getting work, to actually then getting work. And it's really that. that and I remember Brett actually telling me this. It's like once you crack the wall and you get in, you're kind of in. Unless you like really screw up your first job or two, right? If you're in, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, this looks pretty good. Well, hey, well, I got this other thing, mm -hmm. you know. And the business was more personal and informal at that time because you could take your job up, and you would go to the office and you would actually see people, right? You would see the editors. And you could just and at Marvel, they were all kind of like along one wall, so you could just go down the whole down thing. The lane. Yeah. yeah, you could go around the bullpen over to Epic where Archie was. Right. Yeah. So, um, and that's you know, in fact, my first time, I, I, I first time, I went out with Brett. Um, I actually w got a job. The problem was they didn't want to let me take it back to Michigan. 
Mm. So I would have had to stay someplace like in New York. And I just, had, you know, known Brent, and I didn't feel like I could impose on him to say, well, let me live in your <laughs> spare bedroom for, uh, you know, mm. a week. but I it was like some comic that was inside a toy. And oh, so gotcha. like, 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 like an insert, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, they, it was John Reporton was going to give me the job, but they didn't want to let me take, they didn't trust me to go back to Michigan and do it. So I actually would have mm -hmm. started earlier than I, than I did if I had been able to uh, take that job. Um, and just, and to give a picture of what it was like, and if I remember this correctly, we, we drove down to get on the train and we ran into Bill Sienkiewicz, right? And rode in with him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a much smaller business. I mean, if you think of all the guys that worked at Marvel in D.C., you would not go over, what, 50 people, 50 artists, maybe 60 artists. I don't know how many books they published total then. Yeah. And wow. most people lived within that tri-state area, you know, Jersey, New York, Connecticut. I think it was just much easier to keep working because you would meet everyone. And then you go, like you said, you go up and down the office and maybe someone said, hey, how would you like to try and draw this character? I've got a a backup or I'm, you know, I'm going to need a fill in or this stuff happens. All the time. Yeah. I mean, I know there's a lot of guys that got work in the beginning simply because they go up to the office and hang around and yeah. inevitably someone would blow a deadline and they would go, Hey, we need to ink 10 pages by Monday. It was almost like, uh, models at the art school kind of hanging out in the hallway, hoping somebody canceled. <laughs> you yeah. need a figure bottle? You need a figure bottle? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, it was like a sort of like a big, a big family. And um, I think that that's really the difference now is everything is, you know, over the internet. I mean, you might work with people that you never meet. Yeah. It's only you may not even actually physically talk to them. You just talk to them through email. So I think mm -hmm. because of that, it's easier to, it's harder to develop. The personal connection because like you know i work i work with danny as a writer but i also worked with danny as an editor and i would see danny finger off as a person right right but right. there are people that i have worked with over the it was like it's funny i just had a last week i did a zoom meeting with the people at king features so i've been working for king features for all, go, over 10 years now mm -hmm. and that was the first time i'd ever seen anybody's face a couple times I talked to people over the phone, but it's sort of odd. You have this long like shadow term, shadow council, <laughs> right? Yeah. So you have this long term working relationship with people, uh, but you don't have any physical reference to them, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And I think also because now with the pandemic and just reading like Hollywood's probably not going to be able to open back up again, and they're doing a lot more animation, and people are wondering what's going to happen, you know. Uh, they're going to be a lot more people are going to be having to work freelance, having to yeah. work over the internet. And so yeah. I think that there's going to be more of that where you might get to work on a show or get to do a project with a person that you will never actually physically exist in the same space yeah. as that person, you know? Uh, you know, uh, I had another question kind of on that thing. I remember hearing a lot of and this might be more modern or maybe like towards the end of the 90s where there was kind of like not editor interference but the editor was kind of like the touch point for the whole creative team where they didn't really want you guys talking to each other you was, had to talk you had to talk through editorial i was going to mention because i think that you know the 80s were a really golden time for that atmosphere that mike was describing mm -hmm. because yeah we also worked from plots Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing a lot of work with people who were my friends, mm -hmm. you know, like Wheezy, of course, and Anne Vicente, uh, Bob Budiansky, Dan Chichester, Greg Wright. I worked with people who I knew as friends first, in some cases. And uh, so you knew each other so well, you might get a plot or maybe not, you know, you might actually be discussing what the plot was going to be. And if you had an idea, you'd call them up and say, hey, what about this? Sure, let's do that. <laughs> Was that loose and i don't know at what point that corporate structure started to be imposed 
but there was an issue where you were not supposed to talk directly to the people, the other creative people. Every note or question or comment had to go through the editor, um, which in the beginning nobody paid or paid any attention to. Um, but then conditions at Marvel got pretty and pretty stressful, and a lot of, a lot of the people left. You know. Yeah, I think that might have been a result of them being sold. And when they were sold, it was also when, you know, money comes, you know, major money starts coming in. And it was really much more of a fly. It was all like a, I call you on the phone. Hey, man, you want to come over later and have a beer? Okay. Yeah. It was basically, yeah. that was about as complicated as it got. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but then it was like, I think because the Kirby estate was suing them and there was a lot of legal stuff, they wanted to be able to probably have a chain of command. So you could say, if I'm talking to the editor, the editor is the one who okays everything and, and is dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. So you can't come back 20 years later and go, aha, that I was not dotted. And now I will be able to claim that I own Darkhawk. Damn, Damn it. Um, and it did change a lot editorially um, where the editorial would, like Dan said, like, I was doing stuff and they would not want me to talk to Dan. They would want me to talk to the editor and then the editor would talk to Dan. You know, and now they couldn't stop you because everybody has everybody's email and uh, you know, you talk to the editor and they don't even, they don't even return your, your uh, a couple of projects I was working on uh, for DC in the last decade. I couldn't even get the editor to reply to stuff. So, I, in fact, I had to, in order to get paid, I had to call the people at DC to make sure that you got paid to make sure that my vouchers went through. So I got paid. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the internet, uh, you know, the old school guys were used to face to face and they had good phone manner. You know what I mean? Because they were used to phones. Then you had a right. whole. You did your business on the phone. Right, right. Or, phone call, or right. face to face, right? And then you had a whole generation of people come in who did everything over e email and like not over the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I very, I would say 99 times out of a hundred, anybody I communicate with, it's over the internet. Yeah. And my old editor who retired from King features, she was the only person that I actually talked with on the phone occasionally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the people, and, and I have a very good relationship with the people I work with now, but it's not an over the phone. It's all gone email, mm -hmm. you know. There was a question. Well, Brett, you're getting blown up tonight because Gar is just, he's, he's loving, the, loving the questions. And he asked, first, I wanted to check, do you, you're not currently teaching anywhere or have been teaching. Did I miss something? No, I, it's been years since I was teaching Okay. Yeah. I go taught at a college here, and I used to do seminars. Or what? Not seminars. Really, call. I taught regularly, and then I would do uh, not units, but something like the modules or something like that. Mm -hmm. Two weeks, a specialized thing. And then I would sometimes do workshops. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, I can I can bring this question up, and we can float it around, and then we'll start wrapping up for the night. But Gar asks Brett. And I'll just put it to all of us because we all teach in, in our own way. Uh, have you ever turned had to turn down or limit artwork due to teaching obligations? Um, I should have, but didn't. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, I would say that I'm going to be next month. I'm going to be sixty. No, you're not, Brett Blevins. I am, and so I think the last time I was teaching was probably. Before 2010, for sure. Hmm. So, uh, in those days, I was still I was storyboarding all the time and taking other all kinds of advertising, occasionally comics, and I was just so used to working so hard. Right. I would just stay up and get it done, and I used to be able to do that, like all of us. You know, I, I don't work all nighters anymore, but in those days, you know, so you, I've been doing it since my 20s, so mm -hmm. I, I just you know. But I don't recall. I've turned down work because of other work. 
right? <laughs> but not because of teaching. You know, I only taught two days a week. And sometimes we had to come in for a meeting. I think so it wasn't uh, wasn't like I was there every day. Um, Michael, you want to answer that? Have I ever turned out and work for teaching? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why I stopped doing the storyboards because I was in school full time teaching and then also doing the strips. So it was like having four full time jobs. So my last years uh, in school, I would, would be typical that I would basically have four hours of sleep on uh, average Monday through Friday, and then I would catch up on the weekend. So, um, and I still pull a lot of late nights and, and stuff occasionally. Um, but uh, I will probably, this will probably be the first year the first fall where i probably will not be going back to the classroom mm -hmm. to teach well mm -hmm. first of all i actually think by september no one's going to go be going back to art school they're saying that they're doing that but i actually don't see how there's realistically it's possible for people to, mm -hmm. to be able to do that so i don't foresee myself going back to teach this fall although i think in the case of doing things like zoom and stuff with the ability to draw over people's stuff because that's how I teach. I would not just lecture, but then I would, mm -hmm. when I would show somebody something, I would actually put a piece of tracing paper over and then draw so they could see it. Yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, I I think I actually think teaching in general and teaching in art schools and all this stuff is going to go through a real revolution within the next year because of what's happening with the uh, the COVID situation. So. Um, I know guys who make a lot of a lot of their living. A lot of fine artists make uh, a significant amount of their living by teaching workshops. I know mm -hmm. several painters, several friends of mine who are painters, that go, would go all over the world. I think even Bill Ray had one scheduled. I think for the fall or the summer. A lot of guys I know they, that's how they make a significant amount of their income. But you know, nobody's going to be flying, and most people are not going to want to go and. and, and do uh, do that so it's going to really put put the hurt on the hurt on people mm -hmm. what about you um well i've been teaching uh a kind of like a writing class i've been teaching writing for comics at drexel university for a long time like um and i took that job over from john arcudi a long time ago all right yeah um and really was really interesting about that class is that it I kind of structured it to be not uh, just about writing scripts, but more about the collaborative relationship between a writer and artist. And that's something that nobody really seems to teach as far as comics output. You know, there's a there's a million classes on comic book illustration or storyboarding and things like that but not how to like write a script that an artist won't want to punch you in the face for it <laughs> for what was it the 500 uh, army men coming over the hill like don't write that right so uh, really the reason that i was teaching when i was and i haven't so uh, you're touching a couple of minutes, There you go. How's that? Good. That's good. Now good. I can't hear you. <laughs> Hold on one second. All right, I can hear you now. I can hear so, us. Yeah. Okay. So, like, one of the big things with that was I was teaching out of necessity. Like, uh, you know, I've I've had a day job for a long time, and um, most of my work the past 10 to 12 years has been graphic novel work. So, you know, I, if anybody knows about doing graphic novels, uh, the, the pay usually isn't amazing. And there's a long distance between seeing <laughs> your next, your next payout. Right. Well, cause you get what you get two or three installments, right? Yeah. So, and it's all kind of on, on milestones or deliverables. 
So say if you're in the middle of a year long project and then you're not seeing another check until the inks are done, you know, that's, that's tight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So what I wound up doing was taking any gig I could and teaching is something that I think I'm pretty good at. And, you know, my students who kind of pop up once in a while in some of these things always say they had a, a lot of fun and blah, blah, blah. But um, I had to fit everything around teaching, not having to like basically take things off my plate because of it. So it was just kind of like stat, you know, it's a gig culture, stack another thing on, stack another thing on, chase checks. You know how that works. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I think my worst, my worst semester was I had, well, there was a couple times I was teaching two classes. Mm -hmm. I was teaching a class at UArts, but then I was also teaching another class out at the uh, Pennsylvania College of Art and Design, which is on Lancaster. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're doing way, you know, the UArts is right down the street from, from, from Papa. So I would go in, do my class, eat my lunch, sprint down Broad Street to teach my class, mm -hmm. get over at 10, come back to school and either stay and work or I would come, come home. I don't, I, when I think back now, I don't know. I don't know what you were doing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I get a, you, I guess, you know, it's sort of like you do it because you have to do it. Yeah. 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 That's where you I was going. I mean? You do it because you have to do it. You were doing the same thing. You were teaching, running around. I mean, that's, I mean, I think that's part of being an artist is that you, you, like you said, you take that opportunity and you just kind of fit it in. Um, unless one gig pays you so much, mm -hmm. um, or, yeah. you know, maybe, you know, you have a, a wife or a girlfriend, they make enough, or you have a, you, you don't need much right. to live. live cheaply. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I mean, there's mm -hmm. all kinds of different, you know, people that, you know, live all kinds of different, they have all kinds of different circumstances under which, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Like some people cannot grind, so they're not going to work two days in a row with no sleep. They're just not constituted to be able to do that. They can't work. They can't get up and go today. By tonight, I have to draw X amount of stuff. Right. 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 Their brain doesn't work that way, so they might not be a good fit for comics. They might do something with a longer deadline, like kids' books. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, um, so, all right, last question of the night is for Brett. Brett, you're the star tonight, Brett. Uh, from our old pal, Scott Kurtz. Scott Kurtz is a huge Boz Chronicles fan. Uh -huh. and, and he wants to know, before you guys go, I got to know, does Brett own the Boz Chronicles? I asked him in a chat, does he mean IP or pages? But you can tell me whatever you'd like, Brett. Um, I, I have all the artwork. I think I made gifts of about four pages. Mm. Like, hats up. Uh, so I have the artwork. Uh, I'm actually a little bit confused about that. I know that, that David Michelini and I signed a contract, but I'm not sure exactly how it's divided up. I don't know um, if we together own the material we produced. He owns the trademark to the title. Um, I signed that contract in 19 or yeah, 1983. Mm -hmm. So I'd have to do some digging to see what it actually says. Yeah, Scott says IP. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And was that between you two or between you two and Marvel? Epic. Yeah, because that that company doesn't exist anymore, so... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, it is actually in print because Dover Books did a complete reprint of it mm -hmm. a few years ago. And in fact... I'm trying to get everything organized. We have another one planned. It's our, the plot's done, and I've done all the layouts for it and a lot of design. It's just been a matter of uh, trying to figure out how to, with all the other stuff that's been happening in my life, which is a soap opera that it, we don't have time to go into this year. Um, but things finally do seem to be stabilizing for me, and I'd like to get back to, to finishing that did you have any sketches that you did for that? Because um, you were doing some rough stuff, right? You had you had some stuff that you yeah, were doing. I'm trying to remember where it might be. I can also, uh, 
I might be able to find a copy of the book so I can show Scott. It's available. Uh, I guess you can order it on Amazon. <laughs> it's, it's going crazy outside my house right now. It's like, bam, 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 bam. Okay. Yeah. it's not even the 4th of July. You know? Here's a, here's the funniest thing that just happened in the chat room. Uh, where is it? Bill Ray says, I miss Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Only by about, what, 20 minutes or something? Like that? <laughs> yeah. That's great. It was a great episode. Hey, Bill, how are you? Hope you're good. You'll be able to go back and watch on YouTube. You know what? The Yeah, you can watch it on YouTube. Uh, it should just connect right after we uh, cancel the our stream. But I've been having some problems lately trying to do the watch parties on our Pencil to Pencil page. It, I keep getting an error every time I try to set up a watch party. So I'm not exactly sure what's going on. With I, you know, I mean, it's just like all these programs. I think the amount of people that are doing things every day must be constantly growing. Uh, so I'm, you know, like even why I try to boost the ads for mm -hmm. the shows and I'll get like last week, there were several times where I tried to post stuff and I couldn't post with Chrome. Mm -hmm. Open up Safari, and my Safari is an old version of Safari. Mm -hmm. Right away, and does it. So you know, well, not, maybe yeah, maybe I need to update my Chrome. I'll, I'll look into that. Thanks, Mike. All right, Scott Kurtz, this is for you, brother. Can you see it? See if I can get. Yeah. It. Yeah, it looks good. Too bright? No, that's great. That's good. This is the first page of the new story. I don't know if you can see it. Is it coming over there? You're yeah. so lazy. Yeah. Those backgrounds are so lazy. So yeah. lazy. I was goofing off that day. <laughs> um, the, the version of the book that we print them all has new covers and stuff, but I thought it was here, but it doesn't seem to be here. I got the back. Okay, this is a bit of a recap. It's not quite tightened up yet. So yeah. see. I think what Dan was saying is true. You should just print the pencils. Mm. You should just print the pencils and maybe just, you know, tighten uh, just some. I don't think you should ink it. I think you should just print from the pencils. Mm. Well, um, it's possible, I guess. I mean, I always thought of this as being sort of a, a Gibson y Victorian looking thing with the pen and ink. But I can get the book if you guys are going to be on for a second. Uh, I'm I'm cutting this out, but sure, bring, get get the book, get the book. Yeah, let's get the book. Okay. Thanks, Brett. This is this is just for you, Scott. You owe me one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. How many hearts of dying sons are being consumed to power this? Just so you can see. And just remember, and I and I'm very proud of this, Mike Manley. Where else on the internet are you going to get Mike Manley and Brett Blevins in your face? Twice a week, right? Nowhere, wow. except, yeah. except pencil to pencil, and I'm right. everywhere. So, <laughs> well, you're well. You're on your Jamar yeah. coffee clutch, yeah. right? Yeah. Coffee break with JN. We'll have that tomorrow. With Mike Hawthorne, right? Yeah, I do a Patreon exclusive video series with Mike Hawthorne where we answer questions. And then I saw you were on something else. Yeah, I have another Patreon thing I do, especially for my patrons, called Thank You for Having Me with Jamar Nicholas. So now how often do you do that? Um, I, I've i been trying to do them once a week, but I got a little, you know, I have a nice little buffer now. So I'm kind of like sliding so down. So we can see you, what, three times a week now? Four? Well, if you're you join like, my Patreon. Like, 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 like you're you're like a an actual TV personality. I'm like the Black Dick Cavett. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah brother um but yeah yeah so you know i and i think that's one of the coolest parts about what we're doing here is that even you know I'll, i love to big up you guys but even with just you two alone is a show in itself we don't need guests we don't need guests. You're too dirty. We're boring. <laughs> Everybody's heard our stories of him again. So boring. What do you got? 
What you got, Brett? Oh, man. So good. It's put out by um, Dover. So if you can see Dover there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, it has some new introductions. It has some introductions and some few new illustrations in it. And then all the the whole uh, all six issues are in there. Wow. Was that recolored or were they using the original? Nope, the really original color. Who colored it, Brett? Do you, do you remember? I think uh, Joe Chido colored the first one, I think. Wow. Wow. Look. And then Petrus Scotis. I don't know if Steve Olive did one of them. Um, yeah, the credit pages are not, you know, I'd have to read through the whole thing because the, uh, in other words, the old, the interior page of the re original comics are here. Okay, the first one was Steve Olaf. Second, uh, the rest were Petrus Cotis. So, okay, Joe didn't work on this. Confusing that. Yeah, I love those characters too. I'd love to do more. Yeah, that was great. Um, yeah, we're getting a lot of love in the chat. I appreciate all of you guys. And you know, this is what makes it special. It's our chemistry. It's the, it's the shared history of the art form. And also the fact that our friendship really shines through, right? It's not cooked or, or forced. It's just, you know, guys talking shop. <laughs> Don't forget the cool effect of my '50s bowling shirt. I was going to say I like that. Is that? Yeah, is that... My, uh, we all have very uh, different. What do you yeah. got? Your Dungeons and Dragons. I got my. I don't know what <laughs> this is. Like that's your tiki shirt. Yeah, my tiki shirt. But no, uh, it's not a racist tiki shirt. Oh no, no racist tiki right, shirt. Right, not a racist tiki shirt. Uh, JRD says, "What's up with Jerry Ordway?" Uh, we've asked Jerry, so we're trying to coordinate that. He had a lot of, you know, like it took a little while to get Lee on. So sometimes we've asked people right. and we have to work out a day. Mm -hmm. Like we did Lee because he has other obligations on Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, we do have Jerry. Jerry says he's interested in doing it. So mm -hmm. probably sometimes either the end of July or the beginning of August, Jerry will be. Yeah. Year. If you notice, we haven't had a palate cleanser episode in a month. Right, we're just going straight guests. Like every every episode is really so hot. We're gonna come in on the next one. Just gargle with salt water. Ah, oh, <laughs> gargling. It'll be a palate cleansing gargle episode. Bill said this is his first time. Thanks for joining us, Bill. I hope you subscribed on our YouTube channel. Bill says this is my first time watching, but I so want to go back and watch the show with Craig Russo. Yeah, uh, everything is there. Go to YouTube. It's uh, on the channel. Uh, you can also go to our Facebook page, Pencil to Pencil on Facebook. And if you click on the video button, all of the content is right there. So even if you miss the stuff live, it's all it all exists for you. You keep winning, I mean. Okay, I'm going to let you guys go home. Um, we all have, have boards to get back to. We all have art to attack tonight. So I'm going to thank you guys again for joining us. I think this was a really spectacular episode. Thanks again to Dan Panosian, who's also, he's such a gracious guest. And also just, you know, he's a walking master class. Yeah. Um, thanks again to my uh, great Coco host, Brett and Mike. Um, you guys make this stuff shine. And, you know, I'm happy to be a part of this triangle. <laughs> well, I guess Mike didn't like what I had to say. <laughs> Bye, Mike. All right, we'll end it there. So um, remember, we're off this Saturday. So we'll see you on Wednesday the 8th. Um, be safe, watch those firecrackers, and wash your hands. Yeah. It's very dry here, so I don't want anything happening. All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Good night. Oh, you're fourth. You too. Good night. Bye.